here is what we've been building up to. What happens when the cell is not at rest? What happens when there is a neural signal traveling along its length? So this is very important. I want you to know that the neural signal as it travels along the axon, the long part of a neuron, is referred to as an action potential. This is one of the most important vocabulary terms in the biological foundation. Again, when the neural signal is traveling along the axon of a neuron, it is referred to as an action potential. And what I have not yet mentioned is that the cell membrane at the axon contains something very special, sodium channels. As the neural signal travels along the axon, these special sodium channels open up and sodium with its positive charge rushes into the cell. So the inside of the cell momentarily becomes more positive than the outside of the cell. That is what happens during the action potential. And here is a diagram of the action potential. I'm showing you the voltage of the cell in millivolts as a function of time. And you know that neural signals are fairly rapid, so we are looking at time in milliseconds or thousandths of a second. Now imagine that I have a microelectrode placed just outside of the cell membrane and one just inside the cell membrane of the axon of a neuron. And I'm measuring changes in voltage over time. At time zero, when the cell is at rest, you already know what the voltage would read, minus 70 millivolts. And then as an action potential occurs and sodium with its positive charge floods into the cell, you see that the cell is becoming more positive inside than outside. It goes minus 70 millivolts, minus 60, minus 50, minus 40, all the way up to zero and then a little above, maybe even up to positive 15 millivolts. But can it stay there? Can it stay like that? No. We would be dead. We need to be able to have our neural signals um, occurring one after the other. So the cell actually pumps positive ions out of the cell and it is on its way to becoming polarized again so it can send another neural signal. It goes down to minus 10 millivolts, minus 20, minus 30, and then it gets to minus 70, but it keeps going. And it goes a little below minus 70 millivolts, and then it goes back up until it's at rest, and then it's at minus 70 millivolts again. I've put some terms on the screen that I'm not actually going to test you on. Depolarization, polarization, hyperpolarization. But if you learn these words, it may help you understand how the action potential occurs. So you have a cell at rest. It's at minus 70 millivolts. And now there's a neural signal. It's becoming more positive inside than the outside. It was polarized. Now it's becoming depolarized or even unpolarized. Now you have the positive ions being pumped out of the cell. And it's becoming more and more negative inside than outside. So it's polarizing again. It's getting ready to do some more work. You have that little portion of the action potential where it overshoots. And we call that hyperpolarization. It's extra polarized. And there are two vocabulary terms associated with this period of hyperpolarization. There's an absolute refractory period and a relative refractory period. So I actually, in a laboratory, could initiate an action potential artificially by taking a third microelectrode, placing it into the cell, and just applying a very small amount of electrical stimulation. Too much and I'll kill the cell. And I can read the voltmeter while I do that. And I can cause this whole sequence of events to occur, the entire action potential. Now, during the absolute refractory period, if I did that and stimulated the cell, I would not be able to get the action potential to occur. At the beginning of that hyperpolarization period, you have the absolute threshold. I would have to apply so much electrical stimulation, I would damage the cell trying to get another action potential to occur. But it's a very brief period of time, and it's followed by the relative refractory period when more than the usual amount of stimulation can cause an action potential to occur. But after this period of overshooting or hyperpolarization, the cell does go right back to minus 70 millivolts or the resting membrane potential. And it's ready and it's waiting for another action potential to travel along its length. So again, I'm not testing you on the polarization words and I'm not testing you on ions. 
Here is what I'll test you on. I want you to know that the action potential has a threshold. This means that it has to be stimulated to threshold in order for an action potential to occur. If I stimulate it too little, nothing happens. It's an all or nothing phenomenon. If I stimulate it enough, then I do see the entire sequence of events. Up, down, down, really far, and then back to normal. It's more than you need to know, but the threshold is about 15 millivolts. So if I stimulate the cell less than threshold, less than that amount, it just dies out. There is no signal traveling along the length of that neuron. However, if I do stimulate it enough, then it's an all or nothing phenomenon. The entire sequence occurs. Now, I could give you an analogy if you like. Think of the toilet in your home. In order to get the sequence of events to occur, a toilet flushing, you have to push down the handle. Now you could push it down too lightly and it just sort of wobbles in place and a flush does not take place. Or you can push it down far enough and you've got the entire sequence of events, the entire whoosh of a toilet flushing. The water rushes out and then more water comes in and it reaches a certain point and stops. That's the entire whoosh of a toilet. An all or nothing phenomenon that occurs when you stimulate to threshold. You've now seen a diagram of the action potential or the neural signal occurring along the length of the axon of a neuron. And that is what all action potentials look like. I could be measuring the voltage changes for a neuron in your leg, in your intestines, and it doesn't really matter. They all look like this. If you think about it, this should lead you to ask some pretty important questions. If all action potentials take this form, then how is it that your nervous system encodes information about the intensity of a stimulus? How bright is a light? How loud is a sound? How hard is a touch? And so on. This occurs through the temporal characteristics of neural signals. By temporal, I mean time. So I'm looking at the rate of firing, how many neural impulses occur over a period of time. It may be useful to think of the sounds I make as neural impulses. Buh, 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 buh. Certainly your neural signals are much faster than that, but you can think about the rate of neural firing when I make that sound compared to this sound. Buh, 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 buh. My rate of firing is much faster in the second illustration. So even though action potentials all look the same, no matter where you record them in your body, the rate of firing, the number of neural signals over time, allows your nervous system to encode information about the intensity of stimuli. Here is another important question. How do your neurons encode the type of stimulus if all action potentials look the same? How do you know that a light is a light, a sound is a sound, and a touch is a touch? The answer lies in the specific nerve tract stimulated. Give this a try. Close your eyes for a moment, and without hurting yourself, take one finger and touch one of your eyelids, and then move it around. And what should happen is that behind that eyelid, you're going to see some flashing lights because you're mechanically stimulating the receptors of the eye. So that is stimulation of the structures of the eye and the optic nerve and the parts of the brain that are involved in vision. So you are stimulating that particular nerve track, and so you experience that as vision. It's invasive, and I wouldn't do it, but if I were to go in with my little microelectrodes and electrically stimulate your auditory nerve, how would you experience that? You would experience it as sound. So even though all action potentials more or less look the same, the nature of the stimulus, whether it's vision or hearing or touch or odor or taste is going to depend upon the specific nerve tract that's being stimulated.